Hey, want to make a podcast? Spotify has got a platform to let you make one easily. Distribute it everywhere and then earn money all in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters, and here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer. You can start creating today. Then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available on Spotify. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free with no catch. Ever since I discovered Spotify for Podcasters, I've been watching this podcast grow and reach more and more listeners. And I recommend you give it a try. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com forward slash podcasters to get started. And one of the things that really pushed me to write the new book is that I had changed my style of DMing and prepping from the ways that I had written about in The Lazy Dungeon Master myself. And yeah. I, I felt like this is kind of hypocritical that I've got this new these new things I've discovered that have dramatically improved my game. And, and yet I'm still selling this book that does it differently. <laughs> I really ought to do a new book that t- talks about this new way. Mike Shea gives incredible insight into what it takes to make content that people will enjoy. We discuss where the concept of the Lazy Dungeon Master came from and how it's expanded. Stick around until the end when we discuss what he thinks about the future of the role-playing hobby. Any views like this are possible because of the support of floorheads like you on Patreon. I welcome some of our newest patrons. John A. Snowberger, Mad Quacker, Zagrave, Nick Louie, Sledgend, Keller O'Leary, Robert Antony, and Peter Shepard. Okay, sit back, relax, and enjoy my discussion with Mike. Do you love to unplug and play games around the table? Greetings, friends and floorheads to Tabletop Talk from Third Floor Wars. If you love tabletop gaming, you are in the right place. Listen as Craig delivers in-depth discussions and interviews with game designers, creators, insiders, and experts. Learn from the people making and playing the role-playing, miniature, and board games you love. Howdy friends, Craig here. Today we're talking to author and creator of Sly Flourish, Mike Shea. Mike is known for writing The Lazy Dungeon Master, Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master, and one of my favorites, The Fantastic Adventures, just to name a few. Now his website and Twitter feed are full of actionable advice that you can leverage to make your RPG games better. So Mike, welcome to the third floor. Thank you, thank you very much. So, there was a day when you didn't know you could have a sheet of paper and a paradise and pretend to be other people. And then there was the day where you found it. So I'd like to hear your gaming origin story. When did you first get exposed to the hobby? I, I, I actually got exposed through computer games first. Uh, I played the pool of radiance game on my, on my laser one twenty eight, which was a (laughs) Apple two C clone, right? An illegal, the whole machine I'm pretty sure was illegal. Uh, (laughs) and yeah, so I played uh, pool of radiance on it and I was like, what do all these numbers mean? Like, there's a lot of interesting numbers in here. I should, I I love this game and I love that there's numbers and I want to see where they, what they mean. Like, why is my armor class going down when I put armor on? (laughs) And so I went out and bought the second edition player's handbook. Nice. uh, And read it and I'm like, ah, that's why the numbers are going down when I put on armor. And then probably it took probably a couple of years after that where I, I was in high school and I, I, I'd known about d and I had a, a, my, my oldest friend, I've known them more almost, you know, 45 years. And he was into D&D when he was younger. He was like 13 and he was into it. And I remember he had his dad's suitcase that he would nice. take around to people's houses that had all the box, all the OD&D box sets in them. And he actually got out of it. 
Uh, but I didn't get into it till about four or five years later when second edition was a thing. And, um, so I, I managed to get some of my, my high school friends together and we played and it was like the total Monty Hall campaign. And like, I had the uh, DNPC, I had two different DNPCs that I was more than happy to give all the loot to and level them up. <laughs> and one was a wizard who cast polymorph to the fighter who would turn him, him into a Hydra so that he could do like and then had and then cast haste on him so you could do like 36 attacks so all my friends could watch me roll dice for half an hour because that was awesome <laughs> that sounds fun <laughs> and yeah that, that sounds like fun but the, the story was great because they were fighting lord manchun uh lord of the zinterim back when the zinterim were cool like they were nice. actual bad guys and uh they went to like dark hold and they fought him on the you know, zental keep in a big tower and i look i even back then i'm like that that story was fun and i actually <laughs> learned i remember i learned a really valuable lesson when i started giving story elements to my end my my dmpcs so like they started to actually become part of the story that was driving the other characters and now i like that's actually the good way to have a dmpc is like it's not yep. a dmpc it's an npc right exactly. and now it's yeah now it's projecting so yeah, so I, I stopped playing near the end of high school, uh, started again in college for a couple of years. Met, met what another brought you back? Month. Uh, I think I, I wanted to. Uh, you know, one of these like, weird serendipitous situations where I was hanging outside the lunchroom at my dorm, waiting for them to open, reading sort of Shannara. Nice. And a guy came up to me and said, hey, you know, sort of Shannara, that's a good book. Did you ever play D&D? And I'm like, Yes, I did. He's like, do you want to play? I'm like, yes, I do. And he's like, great, you're the DM. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so that guy turned out to be a disaster. That's but funny. One of the other guys at that table ended up being a, a, a lifelong friend of mine. He was the, the best man at my wedding. And, and oh wow, and, yeah. So he was, yeah. So so he he and I played D and D. Then we started playing Magic the Gathering and stopped playing D and D. Yeah. Uh, and then. I, I, I got my, I got a job. I moved out to Washington, DC. Uh, I played EverQuest like the devil for, you know, five years and met my wife through EverQuest and she nice. had friends who played D and D and I became their DM. And so Isn't then, that then, so at that point that was probably 2004 or so. And from that point onward, we've been playing 3.5, 4, 5, Pathfinder and everything else. And it's been a pretty group. much a nonstop. Uh, kind of. Like ish. I still play with, yeah, ish. So obviously my wife and I, you know, have played together ever since. Um, and two of our friends that we played in that original group, we now play with in a different game. But we moved nice. and people moved. And now I, I've basically, since since we moved here, so about 15 years, we've had a regular group. But people come in and out, right? So sure. there's like a, been a, a core group of about three of us who have always, or four of us that have been there. And then we've had other people coming in and out throughout throughout the game. So did you guys ever get uh, non-D D curious? Do you guys sure. explore it outside more, of D&D? More than curious. Oh, yeah. So we played, I mean, I don't know if Pathfinder counts. But we played <laughs> Pathfinder for a little while. Uh, but we played uh, uh, We played a lot of Fate. We played a lot of 13th Age. We played Numenera. We played nice. Shadow of the Demon Lord. Um, what else? I'm sure there's some other games. Uh, but D and D has been your primary. Yeah, but we, I've just always loved D and D, right? And I and I I love it even more now. You know, like I think if I if I didn't have fifth edition, I'd probably be playing something like Thirteenth Age, uh, which That's is still kind of D and D, right? But it's it's like a refined four E style that I really I really think is great. Uh, but I love fifth, and like I'm amazed, I'm amazed at my own attitude towards it because like I was ready to leave three point five when four E came out. Like I was ready to jump ship and I did. And I played 4E and by the end of that, I was ready to leave 4E and go to something new. And then 5 came out and I played 5th and now I'm totally happy with 5th. And I don't have any real, like I, I, I played my last campaign with a bunch of house rules only because I never had really house ruled it. And now I've thrown them all away. I'm like, no, nah, I'm pretty good with vanilla 5E. Like I don't really feel like I need a lot of house rules. That's and a that big deal. And that to me is a sign of, you know, it, I feel like it's a sign that it's a really strong system. I think there's a lot of evidence that it's a really strong system, yeah, but also <laughs> it, it's a system that supports me really well. And, and I'm, so? I'm, uh, it's, it's got the right amount of juicy mechanics to keep players interested and to like, even these guys that have you know, friends of mine that I've been playing with for years and years now, we're still trying new things and trying new builds and all of that. And they still like watching their characters do cool stuff, but it still has everything I need to like really be a story focused you know, story focused DM. 
it's got a good amount of flexibility in some areas. You're like, I wish it was a little more in some directions than others, but it's got enough flexibility that like people can play it real heavily tactically with a grid while other people like me can play theater of the mind and, and very d- dramatic with a lot of dramatic fare and the game still works. That's so cool. I, th- I think it fit that, that right balance. Uh, it feels kind of old schooly. Yeah. Right. But it also has enough of the new, the new tech as they like to say, you know, it's got enough of the new tech to, to, to make it work. Right. They had a very interesting, it was smart on their part. Um, a very interesting group of people involved, you know, so you had like Schwab in there, you know, yep. making sure you had yep. some of that old school feel in yep. it, Monty but Cook you had some people that, yep. that looked at it differently. Um, mm-hmm. and you know, didn't quite make, and you know, came, came back from four strong is probably mm-hmm. the best way to do it. Yeah, and obviously. I, yeah. Right. Like, I, I appreciate, I appreciate the recent, um, maybe four wasn't that bad kind of thing going on. Um, and the reason I appreciate it is because, I mean, we can shit on four all day long, right. For a lot of yeah. very legitimate reasons, but it brought a ton of people into the game. Now, not like fifth, but, um, yeah. there was a lot of people that went from video games. They weren't, weren't like you. They didn't go from video games to two, right. They went, the, people were playing video games then and then saw the pen and paper and were like, what the hell? But right. I talked to a lot of people that, you know, were playing, you know, video games on their Xbox and their Playstations and were able to slide or more and more importantly, uh, playing MMOs and were able to slide into four. Um, yeah, and by like no means Mike- am I saying that four is better, but. Yeah, like Mike Krahulik uh, from Penny Arcade said that, right? Like yep. he wasn't, you know, Jerry was a D&D guy from from way back in the day and Mike was not. But he's like, hey, it's got cards and I understand cards, right? Power cards and stuff like that. And then he got into it in a huge way, having not been into it before. And it was 4E that kind of that brought him in. It's funny because like. I guess I've definitely hit a grognardy sort of level <laughs> where when I see all the love for Fori, I'm like, where were all you people when I was back there doing this stuff? Right? I could like, not agree more. I, yeah. you know, I, I feel like, and, and, it's, and I, it's the other kind part of is craft like, beerish. Yeah. A little bit, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. come on. I was in the trenches, right? I'm, I had the, I was there at the Pathfinder 4E battle at Gen Con in 2014. Where were you? Right. And, so I, so I, some of that is coming from there. And then there's other things where like the things that people liked about it, I'm like, no, like you don't know what you're talking about. Right. Like I, again, I was there, I wrote this stuff, you know, I, and I published this stuff and I can tell you it didn't work like you think it works, you know, and the, and the one is like skill challenges. Like people love the idea of skill challenges. And all I can think about is how they worked in 4E and they didn't, right? They, yeah. they, 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 they were not a good, it wasn't a good design and there's a reason why they're not in fifth. And it's because they, 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 they lock you into a single path and they take away a lot of the creativity of the characters. And then, but people come back with this. Well, that's not the kind of skill challenge I'm talking about. And I'm like, okay, well, well then, then you're not talking about skill challenges. Exactly. Right? Then, now then don't tell me it was new. the 4 skill challenge. Right. right. And, and new things I'm good with. Like a lot of people, no, I meant like, I meant like the progression clocks and blades in the dark. And I'm like, that's a different thing. And that is really cool. And that can work. <laughs> you know, but, but as written, like go read the first, you know, go read the first uh, Dungeon Master's Guide for 4E and read the kind of skill challenges they had in there. And they're a mess. Well, so, and when you talk to when you talk to people with different when you, when the addition discussions happen, which are typically a waste of time, but when they do happen, yeah. you do have to do exactly what you're talking about, which is you can't assume that they were playing it the same way you were, right? Right. And 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 and, and you have to have that conversation, which is a tribute to the game. Uh, the other thing that I don't think is talked about enough, um, and I give Five E credit for, is the ability for. I don't think they lost anybody from four. So you had people that did play four. Yeah. They liked four. And the I fact that right. they were able to yeah. slide into five is a compliment, I think, uh, yeah. to five. Um, yeah. Because they're, it's, they're, it's, right. it was different enough. Yeah, there are some, like you said, who who went into fifth and then felt like they threw the baby out with the bathwater with four. Um, and you know, people, people, people that I that I that I you know, friends of mine who are were, were part of both versions of D and D, you know, say that that like they, they, there's some stuff they took out that that really they could have kept in and, and that would have been that would have been better, and and they're and they're not wrong, uh, you know, they're not wrong with that. But even even them, I think they still, I think you're right. I think. And and I think five E is like it's got to be like five times bigger than four E oh, was at least yeah. at least yeah like yeah. I mean it's been doubling and doubling and doubling and now they said during COVID when it feels like half the companies in America went out of business they had thirty percent growth. <laughs> you know, if like, you if you had told me Mike and you and I are similar age if you had told me ten years ago let alone yeah. you know twenty years ago that Hasbro 
would be restructuring the company around Dungeons and Dragons, <laughs> like, I would have laughed at you. Right. And then you would have told me they made a Doctor Strange movie and I would have laughed at you again. <laughs> yeah. Well, like, and, and, and I love it because I, every so often I get I, I, I talk to people and they're like, D&D needs to do X, right? Like D&D needs to add this thing in there. And you're like, I don't think so. Like, I'm pretty sure they don't need they're to do anything. Okay. Right. Yeah. They're doing fine. Oh, well, yeah. And. You know, and, and yeah, and, and part of it is like you, you know, again, like you weren't there back in the Gen Con Wars of 2013, but like, you know, back in the Gen Con Wars of 2013, everyone was talking about how D&D was going to die with Gen Xers, right? That it was the end, like this was the death throw. And I kind of wonder if Watsy thought that when they were making fifth and said, this is our homage to the old ways of D&D. It's like our, it's our last, like, you know, hey, we just want to have a, we know it's not going to sell. It's right. not going to be a big deal. We're only going to have like five people work on it, but we're going to put <laughs> it out there and it'll be like, you know, it'll be sort of the evergreen D and D that's kind of like the old game. It has some new stuff yeah. in it. And if you read the dungeon master's guide, that's kind of how the DMG reads is like, it doesn't tell you how to play D and D, right? It's just like, here's a bunch of things that make D and D D and D, you know? And I wonder if they felt if that some level when they were writing that and they're working on it, they thought like, this is, this is kind of the end of the brand. You know, and then it turned out like, no, it's the most popular version of D&D ever. I'm pretty sure they nobody would have predicted that. No, I mean, I mean, right yeah. up until, you know, the first, I, mean, I don't know, the first year uh, that fifth edition was out. Every conversation at every uh, about role playing games is why is our hobby dying? Why is the hobby? Why yeah, is it right. getting smaller? How are we, we going to do anything about this? Right? How are we like, going to revitalize it? Four <laughs> no didn't one's, work. No you know? one's saying that anymore. Yeah. Nope. That conversation's <laughs> no, gone. And it's kind of gone with a whimper, right? You, you kind of want like all those people bit. to come back and be like, this is so awesome. Like our hobby's not dead. And instead they're just, they just change their argument to something else. Yeah. <laughs> right. Now yeah. it's like, well, you know, I don't like that. It doesn't have this thing. And like, oh, yeah. Yeah. Whatever. And then, and then, and not, not to get into it. Cause honestly, I don't want to, but then you get the people bitching about it because it's gotten big. Right. And, yeah. you know, complaining because there's the 4E stuff is a little of that. Like there's there's part of me that's yeah, like, that's is this call. a little it's a little hipstery, right? A little like that, you know, 5E is not cool anymore, but love and 4E is cool. And right. again, I'm like, you know, where were you? Right. Like I was yeah. writing stuff. No. Nobody's nobody cared. Right. Like, that's really funny, Mike. That's yeah. funny. So, guys, the Insider Insight series is my opportunity to sit down with designers, developers, artists, writers and creators and learn about how they approach their work. I try to understand their process, inspiration and methods for crafting their creations. And that's what we're going to do with Mike today. So we're going to take a quick break. When we get back from this break, we're going to talk about the starting the Sly Flourish brand. We'll be right back. This is the part of many podcasts where someone comes on, interrupts the show, and explains that you should consider paying for the content that you're listening to right now for free. That pitch man explains by giving a dollar or more a month, you not only support the show, but you allow the show to grow and improve. Here on the third floor, we refuse to interrupt your episode of Tabletop Talk with such time-wasting pleas. We pledge never to run a spot asking you to go to patreon.com and give a dollar or more a month because supporting content creators keeps the content coming. Even if there is a link in the show's description, and there is, we don't ask you to click it and become a patron. We don't waste time rambling about the benefits like early access to episodes, getting episodes without ad breaks like this, or even getting a chance to play in one of Craig's RPG sessions. Anyway, Enjoy this episode knowing Tabletop Talk, despite being supported by its patrons, won't engage in such blatant appeals for support. So, Mike, um, you're a GM, right? You're a DM, yep. right? Yep. And yep. Uh, so... So am I, <laughs> right? And I was I was when I was younger, and I am as an adult now. And a lot of people listening have run games, but not everybody has made another step, which is to actually create content. Um, and, and for whatever reason you have, right? You have decided that I'm going to do more than just play, do more than just create at the table. I'm going to create in a bigger sense. So I'm going to the Sly Flourish Museum, 
right? And I go and there's a whole list of exhibits there. And I'm going to go to the first exhibit that shows me where the where it started. So when did the first idea come about that I wanted to not just create at the table, I wanted to do a little bit more? When did that happen? So it it probably happened at uh, the D&D experience in Washington, D.C., which was, I, I guess it was Winter Fantasy. Winter Fantasy and the D&D experience kind of merged. So it was Winter Fantasy when they first announced 4th Edition. And they had the demo of 4th Edition. And I went to it here. In, I live in the D.C. area. And my wife and I went to it. And we played. And I pulled out my iPhone 1 that I <laughs> waited in line for. And I took pictures of the character sheets and stuff. Because nobody said I couldn't and I hadn't signed any NDA or anything like that. And I posted it to a to a Tumblr account and <laughs> said, hey, check this out. Like, you know, do we have enough material here to actually play fourth edition at home? Was there enough like between the character sheets and like, you know, basically yeah, and then of what little we understood of monsters, do we have enough to play 4E at home? And I don't think Wizards of the Coast was particularly happy with that. But nobody said anything, and they ended up letting me freelance later, so they can't have been that pissed off. Sure. And, you know, so I started with that, and it got a lot of attention. It got, like, RPG Net and N-World and other people linked to it, and like, hey, this is, like, a, you know, person that was there that saw this who bothered yeah. you, and blogging wasn't a thing, really, and... You know, I mean, I guess blogging was no, I, it, it, yeah, blogging was kind of a thing, but like mobile blog, Twitter wasn't even around. And so there wasn't this sort of, you know, nowadays you go anywhere, there's a million pictures of everything, but back then there really wasn't. So I saw like, oh, wow, people really like this. They, they're they interested in, in the 4E stuff. What if I did a 4E blog? What if I wrote a blog about fourth edition? And I was like, what if, but I like the DMing side. So let other people talk about the player bits and I'll just talk about DMing. And then, so what if I did a blog that's just about how to get better at running fourth edition D and D nice, right? What would that be like? And so I started that blog a little bit after, but like, like, um, fourth edition had already been out at that point. They put out the three core books. They had, um, keep of the shadow fell, which is like their, version of the starter adventure for fourth and i started writing a blog about it and i'd already done a lot of blogging in the past i i, okay. I was a big home theater nerd so i did a bun i had a big home theater blog for about 10 years uh, i had a personal blog that was all over the place with whatever i wanted to write there but I eventually turned into a fountain pen review website because i like fountain pens and that's where i learned about affiliate money and i was like hey wow i'm making 12 dollars every time i sell fountain pen <laughs> um and uh so writing I had written regularly, like on the 500 word a day style of writing, like for a decade before I started the DD book. Oh, I wrote a huge EverQuest. I had a bunch of EverQuest stuff too. So I wrote a blog about EverQuest and I also wrote a bunch of fan fiction for EverQuest. So, so I got like quick, all my though, bad Mike, words out. Yeah. Before we go beyond that though, like what, what's driving that for you? So let's not even talk about Sly First. Like you have a desire to publish. You have a desire to share. Do you have a sense of what, where that comes from? Probably my dad. So my dad okay. was an, a freelance, he was, he was a, uh, um, you know, he was an independent author. He wrote uh, a, a novel called Illuminatus, a uh, science fiction cult novel back in the 70s and then wrote a bunch of historical fiction. So he was a writer. So I was kind of right. around that. I don't know if I go so far to say like it's actually in the blood, but it was around me as a profession my whole life. You knew and, that people did that. Uh, I knew that people did that. And I and I net writing, writing, I, I remember I was like fourth or fifth grade when I realized that like, I would get like a 10 page fiction assignment and I'd come in with 20 nice. and I realized like, wow, I can write, you know, like I, I write yeah. and I enjoy it. Like writing for pleasure was a thing. Even, you know, when I was a kid, I wrote a journal for a long time that was mostly filled with angst and, you know, <laughs> I, I, but it got me doing words regularly. Right. It got me into that habit of doing the only way to be a writer. Is you got to write. <laughs> so. Yeah. You got to write. And so like I did it with in back in college, I had a do a blog about doom, the original doom and quake. Nice. And so I wrote a blog about that. So yeah, I just, it's always writing has always been pretty easy for me and, 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 and I like it. Right. Nice. And I think I got a lot of word, a lot of bad words out early, which helped so that, you know, <laughs> my my words later were not so bad. And so it sounds like you were primed then kind of here. You'd already yeah. had the experience. You were familiar with the medium um, and, you know, you know, building an audience and stuff like that. And then so you say, OK, I'm going to I'm going to create something that focuses on 
4E and being a DM in 4E. Um, yeah. Did you have a sense of your voice right out of the gate or is that something that took a little bit of time to find? I've never even thought about my voice. Okay. Um, but like one thing is like I'm a shrunken white, you know, acolyte, right? So I, I kind of early on, I sort of latched onto that book as the idea that that's good writing. And I know there's lots of arguments about whether it is or it isn't, but I, it, it, it stuck with me and that idea of like omit needless words and, you know, speak, speak plain. Right. And so that, that was the style that I took and I wrote a lot of fiction. So it wasn't like I, you know, flowery narrative was out of my world. Um, but I, I would say if I have a voice, it's that. And I've had other people comment and say, and my friend, my friend Teos Abadia, the Alpha Stream, has said that like one of the things about that that he has respected me, that he's respected with me, is is that I I can take a complex thing and do it in a few words. <laughs> right? You, you're easy to read, Mike, and that's a compliment. Yeah, um, and, but, I, it's but I never easy read. That I, that, that I'm, I'm glad. <laughs> yeah. And and yeah, so I I think if I have a voice, that's it. Um, brevity, you know, brevity above all and, and, uh, you know, trying, trying to get that, but I've never, I've never said, you know, it's never, and I don't, I would, I don't know. I, I don't know what it's like for other writers either, but I don't know how much I like, I don't give any attention to, you know, whether this sounds like me. Right. Sure. I, I'm, I'm always about like, what am I trying to say? A lot of times when I'm writing an article, I, I at the top, I just like, what am I really trying to say? And I try to have that like one sentence focal point that says what I'm really trying to. And if I can't come up with that, that means I need to rethink this whole thing. Right. Maybe even throw it away and start over. But if I can come up with that one nugget and sometimes I keep it in there and that's the first sentence in the article. I'm like, you don't have to read anything else if you don't want, right? That one sentence will tell you what I'm trying to say. And then the rest is sort of backing up the, backing up the thought or going into some more depth. Um, but that's, that's always kind of been how I approach it. And um, so, yeah. So let's talk about growth, worked. Mike. Um, you know, the, the way I am finding when I talk to a lot of creators that the growth works is, you know, you have, you have the steady growth, right? The word of mouth and Hey, have you checked this guy out and so on and so forth. But then you have spikes, you have spikes and plateaus. And, and I'd be curious to know what some of the early spikes were. So where, where were times where you just saw the audience jump and, and why did it happen? Yeah. Uh, luck, you know, no one wants to <laughs> hear that is. luck is the, right. No one wants to hear it, but the truth is it's it is. the right place at the right, be the right place at the right time. So for me, my first spike was when I was starting to do my, my daily D and D tweets and Mike Krahulik retweeted something I had done. I think he retweeted an article or I think he didn't even just retweet it. He posted a tweet saying like, if you want to read good 4E stuff, check out this guy's blog. Nice. Right. And I mean, that was a big spike, right? That was immediately like double the audience that I was getting. And I, it's one of those like butterfly effects. You're like, I don't know what effect that has had down to this day or not. Yeah. Right. But at the time it was a big one and, and having Mike Krahulik say something like that, I was like, oh, thanks Mike. Yeah, that's good. I was very appreciative. And of course I wanted to like, oh, I double down and I'll, you know, and it's, no, that was it. So um, that was one <laughs> spike. Uh, I would say another spike was publishing the Lazy Dungeon Master. Uh, you know, I had, I had put out two other sort of D and D self-help books before that, the lazy DM or uh, dungeon master tips and, um, running epic tier games, uh, dungeon master tips sold, sold well and continues to sell now, even though it was written during the fourth edition day. And, you know, I think, I think you could probably get a lot of it. I think I even need giving it away at this point. I'm not sure. I think like you can get the text online. Um, but, uh, what doing the lazy dungeon master, which didn't feel to me any different than any of the other books I wrote, uh, that resonated with people that, that, you know, yeah. that I, the ideas that were in that book, uh, stuck with people and that, you know, it was a, it was a real problem that people had of, I don't have enough time, you know, there's like two, two, you know, a few ideas run. I don't have enough time. How can I still run a game when I don't really have time to prepare it? Right. Was, was one, but then the other one is how can my game be better by the fact that I didn't prepare Right. Or how, that I prepared less or how do I prepare so that the game is the most fun was, you know, a new concept for me when I wrote it. Right. Yeah. Something I'd heard from DMs. It was right at that transition between fourth and fifth edition. It was during the D&D &D next days when that book came out. But that was another spike. Right. That one. Like I can look at my, you know, if I if I look just at revenue, you know, I have this like every month I do all my my book, my my bookkeeping. And I have a chart that's from the beginning of when I took a dollar to yeah. now. And you can see these occasional spikes. And that was like a, a first, the first, sure. you know, 
that was the first big revenue spike. First popularity spike was probably the, the micro Hulik thing. Um, the next clearest one that had another big sort of powers of 10 increase was return of the lazy dungeon master, which was not, that wasn't luck, but it was certainly unpredicted. Uh, I was afraid I was going to wreck the idea with a new book. Like I was, I was worried that I was going to put another book out and everybody's gonna be like, wait, I already have the other one. Do, which one should I get? Or like, why are there two? Never mind. I'll get neither. Right. And I worried about that. And the very first review on Amazon was, I like the other book better. And I was like, well, that sucks. Right. But I did a Kickstarter. So I'm like, well, at least the book's paid. Right. Like I'm not going <laughs> to, I'm not going to lose money. And the Kickstarter did very well. So I was pretty happy overall because I, I, I mean, the Kickstarter alone had sold more than all of the original lazy dungeon master did. So that worked out really well. People were definitely interested in that. It's still my most popular, most successful Kickstarter. And it was done a long time ago. So, um, that was definitely another big spike, uh, when, yeah. when, when that came out. And I would say the next biggest one has happened pretty recently, uh, probably within the last couple of months. Wow. Uh, yeah. And, and I can attribute it to essentially two, two things, newsletters, having a newsletter that I start to care for and doing a lot more with YouTube and being more conscious of what I'm putting up on YouTube. And both of those have resulted in, uh, a, a large sort of, you know, new set of attention. And I think, I, 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 you know, kind of studying that the lesson I would take from it is to always, you know, I'm saying this to myself, I'm not offering advice because advice is sure. generally BS, you know, and, but, but if I was to take a lesson from it myself and ponder it, the lesson would be always be evolving to fit the new mediums, uh, more so than like which one of your social networks, because like Twitter was a big deal and isn't now. Right. Like influence on Twitter is not nearly as big as people think it is. And in fact, is I think it's dangerous because people think you have more influence than you do. And then you say something dumb and everyone's like, you're, you're hurting the whole world. I'm going to yeah. come to your house. Right. And, and you're like, no one's listening, man. You were the only one. <laughs> right. The algorithms yeah. don't care. So um, and that was one where like, you know, YouTube turned out to be a much more useful social media network for promoting stuff than Twitter has been in the last year or so. Yeah. And to your point, Mike, you've got to, you've got to, you've got to meet your audience where they are. Right. Um, uh, you know, we're not, you like to think that if I'm just going to put out good content, people will find me. Yeah, that, well, no, sorry. that's not how it works. <laughs> right. uh, that's not how it works. You know, and yeah. I've had people say to me, you know, why are you on Twitch and YouTube? And I said, because there's people that are on Twitch and there's people that are on YouTube. That's why. Um, and you do, you just, you have to run out and you've got to meet them there. Um, right. so guys, let's take a quick break. When we get back from this break, I want to dig in a little bit more on this lazy dungeon master concept. It's how I first found Mike and I want to find out where the hell it came from. We'll be right oh. back. Uh oh. Are you a tabletop RPG player that is considering becoming a game master? Are you a veteran GM that is always looking for different ways to improve your games? GM Mastermind is an RPG podcast that tackles topics catering to the art of game mastering. But Craig, there are a lot of RPG podcasts that do that. Perhaps, but GM Mastermind has the brain trust. It's a guest panel made up of two to three game masters from different backgrounds and experiences that share their personal insights on a particular topic. This keeps the conversation fresh, diverse, and insightful from one episode to the next. So head over to gmmastermind.com or subscribe to GM Mastermind wherever you find your favorite podcasts. So I've been curious when I was reading The Lazy Dungeon Master, which I thoroughly enjoyed, um, and I bought the second book, and it's good that you wrote a second book, just for those of, lo those of you listening. Um, one of the first things that popped into my mind, and I and I don't know, I mean, you, you talk about it a little bit, but I, I want to talk to you about it, is had you solved the problem, then you wrote the book, or did you identify the problem 
and then say, I want to write a book about it and then figured it out. Like, where was the cart? Where was the horse? Um, you know, was it a situation, Mike, where you were, you know, you, this is how I was running games for five years and I realized nobody else was. So I wrote a book about it. So can, can you kind of give me an idea of how that all came together, the concept? And um, uh, we should probably give people a little bit of an overview, too. Sure. Do you want me to start with the overview? Whatever you prefer, my friend. I just, yeah, so, so, I, I just yeah. throw like 10 questions at yeah, you. Yeah, no, I'm good. <laughs> now, one thing I'll say that kind of leads back to another one is that about, you know, let's talk about me. Um, but That's what this the, podcast the, is about. <laughs> yeah, yay. So my favorite podcast about me So um, is, is about writing. Now, writing has been a way, it sounds so pretentious, but writing is a way for me to explore the world. Sure. Right? Writing is thinking for me. I think yep. that's true for a lot of people, but writing that's is thinking for me. That's why I asked the me. question, yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, so when you, you know, it, as it relates to this and the idea, like, was I solving the problem when I wrote it? I mean, kind of a little bit of both, right? Uh, so yeah, to give, to, to give sort of a summary of, of Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master, and I'll try to do this in like 30 seconds. Uh, one, you know, it's a book that kind of has three major looks, uh, how you prepare for your game, how you run your game, and how you think about your game. And then it's broken into a bunch of chapters for each of those three main sections. And most people get the best value from the how do you prepare for your game chapter, which breaks game preparation down into eight steps. And the eight, the eight steps are review the characters, come up with a strong start, outline your scenes, come up with 10 secrets and clues, come up with some uh, fantastic locations for your, for your characters to explore, come up with some interesting NPCs, figure out what monsters make sense for the situation, and uh, figure out what treasure you're going to reward. Uh, I've, I know my book well enough that I could whip those out without even looking at anything. So I'd be worried um, if you didn't. <laughs> well, I don't know. Sometimes I screwed up. I'm actually quite proud of myself. So, um, so that, that I consider like the framework, right? And, and so that came about during writing the book, but right. major pieces of those were things that I was doing. And one of the things that really pushed me to write the new book is that I had changed my style of DMing and prepping from the ways that I had written about in the Lazy Dungeon Master myself. And yeah. I, I felt like this is kind of hypocritical that I've got this new, these new things I've discovered that have dramatically improved my game. And, and yet I'm still selling this book that does it differently. <laughs> yeah. I really ought to do a new book that t talks about this new way. So not even talking about the content wise, stylistically, what had changed between that? Like, how had you as strictly a DM, not a producer of, of or, or a writer, how did how were you running games differently? So the biggest one and you, you, yeah, you said it's more stylistically than specific, but I can't really separate the two. But like, sure. So the big the big one was secrets and clues. Uh, that, you know, step four, I think is secrets and clues. And I, I started doing that. I started using like the lazy DM style of, which also sort of has it, but it's kind of three steps instead of eight. And yep. the problem is you kind of need some other steps when you're doing it. You can't really just get away with three. Sometimes you can, but sometimes you can't. And so I, um, I started doing the secrets and clues and I picked it up from a couple of video games that I was playing. I'm big into the, uh, uh, the from software games, the dark souls games. And there's one called bloodborne. That was the first one I played frustrating and you controller throwing game. But, yeah. uh, one thing that was really cool is that you, you had no idea what the story was, but every item you picked up had like a one line bit of lore that told you what the story was over time. And I was like, that's a really powerful idea. Can we yeah. do that in D and D? And then I was like, well, what if we didn't even time to an item? We just write them down. And then when the item shows up, we drop a secret on it, right? And I started doing that. I'm like, wow, this is changing my game, right? This is, the, you know, I always thought like, we know what the role play pillar is in D&D. &D. We know what the combat pillar is. But what exactly the hell is the exploration pillar? Yeah. What does that even look like? And to me, I was like, these secrets and clues are the exploration pillar. This is the, the reward that characters get by exploring things. And I will throw that out there. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and it worked really well and it worked well for me for years. And I was like, I gotta, I gotta put this in there. So that's one that I brought into the book when I was writing it. But then there were others like outlining scenes and, uh, 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 you know, what treasure, you know, where I realized like, what do you really have to have to have a game if you had <laughs> nothing? And it's like, you can't not write down an outline of what scenes you're going to run. Like everybody does that. So I was like, it's got to be in there. That was actually the last step that made it. It was seven steps. And I'm like, that, it doesn't make sense not to have that. It's weird not to have that. So I was like, that's got to go in. Um, there's also, you know, I'll give you a, a little secret here. There's kind of a ninth a ninth uh -oh. step too. I know. And it's not quite like I need to write a new book worthy. Um, but hooks, 
Uh, yeah. what are the, what are the hooks that draw the characters into the story? What are those hooks? And the reality is you can pack those in your start or you can throw them in secrets right. or you can throw them in scenes. There's lots of places to drop them in. And I don't want nine steps because <laughs> now it's getting complicated, but like and that, you know, eight is already eight is more than enough. And you're pushing and, it. And yeah, you're pushing it. And nine, like, ah, <laughs> uh, you know, I wouldn't be able to rattle them off like I did before if I had nine. Um, but the reality is that's probably one. I don't, I don't want to say it's missing, but it should have probably had more attention than it did. Maybe a little bit more explicit, maybe. Yeah. The, I guess most of the time it's like, you kind of don't need hooks cause you kind of already know where you're going. Right. Um, but they're important enough. And it's like, that certainly is missing. If you don't have it in a, an adventure, you're writing, you know, you need a, you need the characters need reasons to go on adventures. Yeah. And what I, what I, I think one of the things I thought was very interesting and, and sometimes you outline it a little bit in the books, but I think it's more hinted at um, is, is this idea of, you know, player driven and, mm -hmm. you know, don't, don't uh don't make those decisions just set the scenes yeah. and you know lay lay the table and let the players do what the players do and um what i love about you know don't come up with three secrets come up with come up with a nice chunky yeah. handful good so yeah, as good they come ten. through yeah. yeah so you so you have options right you haven't limited yourself and i thought that that was excellent do you find yourself when you're running games mike to l really let the players kind of drive the narrative um and 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 if so when do you get involved so when do you yeah. come in and go hey you know let's 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 push over here with a hook or let's move over here with a with a secret yeah so i yeah right i call it like situation based gaming and i'm you know i'm not the only one that's written about this like justin alexander and the alexandrian has written about it and yep. lots of people talk about this idea uh and it doesn't always happen like it's not you know not every not every D, &D game is like it but when it is it's really kind of fun and that's that idea like you know i, I ran a game on sunday characters are going to a Durgar outpost right and the, the scene, the situation is they have to go to the Duergar outpost. It's filled with a bunch of Duergar and they have to find out what threat the Duergar are to 10 towns, right? To the, the place that they're trying to defend. So they had a goal, they had a location, they had people at the thing, and then they can take whatever approach they want. And it, right. it, the chapter, the, the chapter, it's from a published adventure, but I recognize like, oh, that's a great situation. And, and I, I don't know what path they're going to take. So then it's like, well, while they're exploring it, they can see there's a front door and they could go kick in the front door. You know, they can see that there's a frozen river leading to a culvert at the base of the, uh, the base of the wall. So they know they can get in there. And there's this strange watchtower, right? So they can, you know, try to figure out what's going on with the watchtower. Um, and I've run it for multiple groups and they actually both ran it the same way, but there yeah. were these options yeah. and I didn't know what direction they were going to take. Right. And it was fun to kind of see how they approached it. Are they sneaky? Are they trying to pretend to be somebody they're not? Do they just get into a big fight? Um, but, and, and, and so I let it go. The only, so when you, you know, on the order of like, well, when do you have to kind of cattle prod him a little bit was I, I had one of the players who's kind of the one who's the most driven to sort of have the group go a certain way who's like i think we can leave now like yeah i think it's time to go it's it looks real dangerous in there let's go and i had to be like do you have everything you need to answer that question and he's like nope i guess we're going back in right, <laughs> right? and so that was one where i kind of had to like shove him a little bit sure. you know because it's like you didn't actually accomplish your goal, right? Which you do, yep. but you, you're not thinking about the goal right now. So there is that like you have to reiterate the goal a couple of times to make sure that they know why they're there. It's very common in a situation-based scene to have the players go, why are we here again? Right. And this is that, you know, a new rule of thumb that I have, which is like the players are only getting about half of what you're talking about. Right. And and so you, you have to say it twice or more than twice to make it clear, especially when they have these open ended scenes. Right. Like. Uh, uh, the final, the scene from the final enemy in Ghost of Salt Marsh, where they go and they they're at a Sahuigan bay. It's basically a temple that the Sahuigan took over, and it's submerged. And your reason to go there isn't wipe out the Sahuigan because there's like 200 of them, but it's there to see like to do recon. Yep. So you want to give them like here, are the th you know, here are the things that the the the, the government is, that the Council of Salt Marsh wants you to find out. And I'm going to write them down on the three by five card to put it in front of you, so that when you're there, you know why you're there yep. and you're ready to do it. Yep. Um, but yeah, there is there is some talk about situation based D and D gaming in return uh mostly in like the separation of monsters and locations and kind of recognizing that these are dynamic and fluid situations but it, but there isn't like a specific you know chapter on it um in the next book there will be oh look at you so <laughs> I, i'd be curious mike you, you already kind of 
talked about this a little bit. You talked about the first <laughs> the first Amazon review on return and uh, saying, you know, I like the first book better. Um, I'm always fascinated. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. one thing to write. It's one thing to get stuff out there. Um, it's always very interesting to hear what comes back. So I'd be curious, you know, over the years now, because, you know, the, the two books weren't ris- written yesterday. Can you think of any feedback, positive or negative? I don't care that, that surprised you stuff that you oh, didn't that's anticipate. A good question. Uh, I did. I mean, this chicken shit answer, but like, am I allowed to swear? I'm sorry. I yeah, don't know if yeah, I'm allowed yeah. to swear. So like, it surprised me how popular it was. Right. And, and I'll tell you, it's, su- it, it's, I know, but it sounds so bad. Um, it, it, it surprises me every time. Uh, I remember I, I listened to an interview with a guy who talked about, I think it was Wikinomics. And he talked about the idea of like, uh, the, the wisdom of the crowds when it came to prediction, right? And that he had done a bunch of studies and research that showed that, uh, you know, when you have a thousand people guessing something, it's usually better than if you have a couple of experts guessing. Sure. And and so uh, the interview the interview that I was listening to, they said like, hey, we actually ran the experiment. And he's like, uh-oh. And, he goes, and it turned out to be right. And he's like, whoo, <laughs> right? <laughs> and he's yeah. like, I'm always waiting for somebody to tell me I'm wrong. And that's kind of what I'm waiting for, right? Like yeah. I'm real. I always kind of like, you know, always like antsy when I see an email or something. And I'm like, this is going to be a person like, hey, I switched to your style. My group left, right? Like <laughs> turns out this is terrible. And I'm and, on Twitter. I'm coming to your house. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I, I read about Twitter and I think you're, you're hurting D&D and I'm coming to your house. So like I, I – you know, I'm always surprised by how many people uh, just it resonated and it worked. It worked for them, and and I'm I'm really glad. But you know, there's you know there's kind of science in that book, but not really. So you know, it's not like I ran ten you know a, a thousand groups with this style yeah. and another thousand a different style and did a big study and found out it absolutely is the right idea. Yeah. It was like no, this is working for me. And I've talked to a lot of DMs and I've you know I've kept my eyes open to how this works and I think that this works and I'm really glad it does. That's cool. Um, so yeah, I'm always happy to. I'm always I'm happy and I'm a surprise because I you know I haven't seen a lot of people who have. I there have been a few who are like this is bad, and there is at least one that I know of who is like you're ruining D and I think there's at least two that I know of. They said I'm ruining D and D. You're not a content creator if you're not ruining the game you're writing right. about. Right, and I'm also I mean, like, that's a you know, rite of passage. Well, yeah, lucky me having all that impact. Right. You know? <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> wait till Watsy find you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So <laughs> they'll come to my house. It's amazing. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. I'm what was, to the, what was like, their contention out of curiosity, Mike? So the person that said you were ruining D and D, do you remember what, what yes. their beef was? So in, in, in one case it was, well, so there's actually a couple of arguments and I think this has come up from a number of one, a, a few people. One really, some people really hate the idea of being referred to as lazy, right? They're like, I'm working my ass off to make it's this game. It's a great running. fucking title, dude. I know. And then like, yeah, you don't know how sticky that title is, right? I have oh. another guy who's a big, like, he's a marketing guy and he knows it. And he's like, man, you, you, you did well with that title. I'm like, I know it's luck. He's like, oh, I'm so jealous. Yeah. So, you know, right. And I get it. Like, of course it's not lazy, but efficient, you know, the efficient dungeon master isn't as sticky. So, <laughs> but they, they don't like, they, they, they really hang on tight to the, to the banner of DM and they don't like the idea of being considered lazy. And, and that's fine. Like, then don't be lazy. Work your ass off on stuff no one cares about you know you won't be the only one and um so so one argument was that uh one argument is that sort of the loosey-goosey nature particularly the the willingness to change things behind the scenes uh is 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 an antithesis of, of D. that's not how you're supposed to be the, the game is set a certain way right when those goblins are on the table there are that many they won't change. They don't do stupid things. They have as many hit points as the book says they have, you know, and, and the idea of like, you're, you're cranking the dials in the background, you know, they don't like that idea of the man behind the curtain, right? They, they feel yeah. like they are truly objective and it's supposed to happen a certain way. And if it sucks and everyone hates it, that's the will of the gods. Yeah. Right? I didn't play the adventure cause you made some changes. So I, you know, th- this yeah. wasn't actually the adventure. I actually, I mean- right. One of the things that got me to not run organized play adventure, Adventures was I ran an organized play adventure and I changed the spell listings for one of the NPCs and one of the players knew I had and I'm like well first of all shame on you for knowing this adventure so well that you know what spells the bad guy has prepared but second I'm not a spreadsheet right like exactly. you could go home and play and not have anybody change anything and but it was enough that I was like you know what that's what people are uh, you know I, and this isn't always true and, and I'm it's years later but like I was like well if this is what organized play people want I'm not the best DM because I changed 
things all the time. Yeah, I've had players, you know, um, they're saying, you know, I, I'm really anxious to read read this adventure because I'm, most of the stuff I do is, is at least starts with something that's been published, right? Most of the games I run start mm -hmm. with something published and then I just kind of see where it goes from there. And I, I tell them, I'm like, you're going to be disappointed because, you know, I, I go off the rails real fast right. uh, because I follow you um, and, you know, you're not going to you, you'll read stuff in you'll read stuff in this adventure that was never going to be in our game. Right. So it's not like you didn't find it. It was never going to be there. Um, uh, so, yeah, I could see that. I can see where people get ticked off by that. But I I don't know. I feel like I'm, I'm more in your camp, Mike, where I feel like they're missing out by by not running games that way. Sure. Um, yeah, that's interesting. So, guys, we're going to take another break. When I get back from this break, I want to take advantage of the fact that Mike has been here the whole time playing these games and he's kind of tuned into what's happening today. So we're going to talk about games. We're going to talk about the industry. We'll be right back. You like science fiction, right? You love playing games, maybe even role-playing games. But what if you can't get your friends together for a game night? If you love games like Mothership or Orbital Blues, check out Dead Belt, a card-based space western solo strategy RPG about skillful and desperate scavengers Picking over the remains of junked starships in hopes of a juicy payday. In it, you deal with lurking dangers, push your luck, and walk away with enough cred to keep on flying. Of course, you might get eaten by lurking aliens, or run afoul of rival scavengers, or face the murderous ghosts of long dead spacers. <laughs> no one said life in the dead belt was going to be easy. For more information on this and all of Sean and Abby Drake's games, swing over to a coupleofdrakes.com. The link's in the show notes. So we, we really spent some time already, Mike, just talking about how much you love 5e. Um, and in full transparency, um, I d and is not my game. Um, but I like for me, that's not a, like an issue, right? Like if I find somebody who loves D&D. &D, we're playing the same stuff. We're, we're, we're in the same hobby. I'm a firm believer in that. Um, it doesn't matter whether you're playing Blades of the Dark, you're playing you know, fight, you know, D Dungeon and Dragons. We're all this is role playing. This is what we do. Um, so I know how much you love it. And I and I completely agree with you. So it um, me not playing it is not a commentary because it's a phenomenal system and it's a great game. Um, but I would really be interested in either things coming for D&D &D or that have come out recently for D&D &D or non D&D. &D. Like, what are you like really psyched about right now? Is there something that's coming that's got you excited or something that's come out recently that has really occup occupied your brain space? and and gotten you pretty psyched up i have a uh u-haul of dwarven forge coming later this year so oh be, nice <laughs> that'll be fun as a guy who plays a lot of theater of the mind you always want to have lots of dwarven forge on hand <laughs> um i mean i'm i'm always eager to see kind of the future progression of the stuff that wizards of the coast puts out so uh i know they have i think three books coming out this year one is an adventure one's a um, another magic the gathering setting and then some mysterious third book uh that hasn't been announced yet and uh i'm i'm eager i'm eager to see what the next adventure is going to be like I'm also a little apprehensive because I haven't been crazy about the last couple that have come out, right? What what's been your uh struggles with the last couple? The uh they they're not they're not helping me as a DM run the game. Yeah, that they, I feel like uh in both I've had to make I feel like I've had to make significant changes to get them to run the way I want them to run. And um where I I, I much prefer to have the option to make them go that way. So uh, when I ran Curse of Strahd and I ran Tomb of Annihilation, those are two adventures where I felt like I had a lot of freedom to let the game go in interesting directions. And that when I found things in those games, I, I have the freedom to change those adventures, but I don't have to. Right. And, and the things that I do have to are small and they're like turning a dial a quarter, mm -hmm. a quarter bit. With Descent into Avernus and Rime of the Frost Maiden, 
I, I reading them, I felt like there were major structural problems. There was foundational problems that I had to address to get the game to work. And in the case of like Frostmaiden, I feel like I'm hitting them while I'm running it. I'm like, ooh, how's that going to work? Right. And then I have yeah. to turn the dial again. So they have a new one coming out, you know, and I'll buy everything they put out. I love, I sure. love what Wizards puts out. The production value is really high. So they have a new one called Witchlight. And I'm very, it was something, I don't even know the full title. Witchlight is somewhere in there. And it's a fey adventure. And so what I'm excited about is an adventure that is not a grim dark, you're either in hell or the frozen wastelands of the frozen north, where hopefully we can see some whimsy, you know, yeah. put put the fantasy back into the, the fantasy RPG. Yep. So I, I'm, I'm excited about that. Um, I'm really excited by all the really excellent third party stuff that's coming out. Uh, two publishers in particular that I have been following, which are both big. So I'm, I'm trying to shine more attention to smaller publishers too because like Cobalt Press is putting out phenomenal stuff. They put out like four major books a year. They have four Kickstarters a year plus a bunch of other stuff. And there's their quality is excellent and real high quality stuff. So they have a new dungeon delving book that's coming out. They have a new campaign source book for the Southlands coming out. A lot of great stuff. Uh the other group that has now started to make a real impact on 5e I don't know on popularity, but certainly been quality is uh, Monty Cook Press. Yeah, so, you know Monty Cook was on the plate. He was he was one of the. I guess he was a contractor for Wizards during D and D Next. Uh, left Wizards and uh, really fired up Monty Cook Games and made a game called Numenera. And Numenera is an awesome RPG. It's I a love it. Game. I, I you know I said I would be playing Thirteenth Age. I think I'd probably be pay, be playing. Um, uh, I think I'd probably Numenera. be playing Numenera. So. Uh, I love it to death. Well, the, he had Monty Cook Games has started to make more 5e stuff, and they put out a great big book. They had a Kickstarter for it called Arcana of the Ancients, which is all like bringing science, tech, you know, fantasy technology into a, a 5e game. And I used a lot of it in an Eberron game that I ran. It worked really well. They have a big book of monsters um, yep. called Beast, Beast of Flesh and Steel. Uh, they have adventures that they put out, like campaign adventures uh, that they put out that are really cool. So I'm really enjoying seeing the stuff that's coming. Oh, and they brought out uh, Tolis. Um, you know, have you seen Tolis? I have not. Oh my God! Just hang on. Yeah, I know this is make for great radio. Um, Holy that, shit! Yeah, it's a seven. It's a six hundred and seventy page campaign book. By Unbelievable. Cook. Here, I'll, let me let me put it on my desk. Right. Oh, so like that's incredible. It's it's like two encyclopedias. It is. It's huge. Yeah, it's yeah. like two inches deep, and um. So this was a campaign that Monty Cook had made for third edition. This huh. was his test to run third edition and try it. And he made a city of a, a, a one to 20 city campaign. And uh, he then remade it for both Cypher system, which is the uh, system that runs Numenera. And he made a fifth edition version too. And I was super eager to, you know, cause this is like, you don't, I, I don't think you can, you know, they can't make a lot of these, right? No, no. I, mean, I think it's Lord. 150 bucks too. So it wasn't cheap. Yeah. The, sure. The, the MSRP is 150 bucks. So, but it's really, it's just a fun artifact to have. Um, I'd be curious, like what, what did you grok so hard in that? Like, why did you like that so much? What impressed you about it? I mean, other than the size of it. <laughs> <laughs> working my shoulders by, you know <laughs> so um i love the idea of an entire campaign that's built in a city yeah that that goes to 20th level and that it has like this central spire where you're seeing like the bad guy right like you know like I, one day like you know two years from now we're gonna be up in that tower fighting some huge horror but right yeah. now we're going down to the sewer to fight some rats you know and i like that it's this self an entire self-contained con campaign world that's my cool. only problem is i just ran a big campaign campaign where half of it was set in the city of Sharn in Eberron. And I'm like, I can't do another big city campaign. <laughs> so in a couple of years, maybe I'll whip that thing out. We'll try it again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So I, I'm really excited to look at like what third party publishers coming out, you know, and, and like Kickstarter has sort of, you, you talked about those like notches up, right? Kickstarters hit another one where now we regularly have seven figure Kickstarters it's for amazing. D and D books. And you've got Nord games and ghost fire games and two C gaming and all these different small companies that are now making outstanding products. They're hiring staff. Yep. You know, my, my friend, Sean Merwin is like the, the lead creative guy at, at ghost fire games, right? Sean is an incredible dude. So, you know, it's really great. Uh, yeah, Celeste Conowich got hired by 2C Gaming and has brought her campaign setting to there. Amazing. So we're, we're seeing a lot of really great third-party stuff 
uh, coming out that, in my opinion, rivals and in many cases surpasses what uh, Watsi is putting out for five. What Watsi's doing, and I think that's outstanding, right? It means that D and D doesn't, you know, isn't held to one company, right? You know, right. Is there in your mind? Are we anywhere near a fear of the open license bubble that we experienced way back when? I mean, I don't think so, um, Good. because the world is so different than it was, and. If you if you're worried about a glut of products, all you have to do is go to the DMs Guild and drive through RPG, and that glut has been there for like years, right? There's Good point. thousands and thousands of products, and some of them people will pick up, and some they won't. So I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't think so. And I, I, you know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I don't know the actual history of the the OG of the of the the, the OGL glut and and when they you know, had those problems. I think that was mostly a game shop problem where they couldn't, they didn't know which titles they needed to have on the shelf at any given time. And every title was sort of eating up every other title. Yeah. And now it was, yeah, it was a quality issue too. Sure. But like the problem with the, the, the quality doesn't matter if nobody's looking at it. Right. And so now we have stores where you can have a million titles and that's okay. Right. And, and the, the quality, like, I guarantee you, this will come as a shock to you, but I bet you not every single DM skill product is, is super well done and, you know, has everything going well. So certainly not because I have some stuff there. So, you know, I, I, I don't know that there's a limit, right? Yeah. Like you would think, like I, I made, I made sort of, I make ignorant statements on Twitter and then people come to my house, but like I made an ignorant statement that's like, I don't need another campaign setting. Like, I'm just, I'm good, right? I have more yeah. campaign settings that I could run. I don't need any more. And people are like, man, you're an idiot. Like, you know, why would you limit something like that has this unlimited horizon? And I'm like, yeah, you're right. Why would I? That's stupid. Of course I like campaign settings. And of course I'll pick up more because every one of them is fuel for my imagination, right? Like, exactly. Yeah. So yeah, so it was a dumb, it was a dumb statement. Well, I, well I, and there's two, there's two hobbies, Mike. There's yeah. Buying the books and running yeah. the books, right? And they're well, two and separate hobbies. And maybe glancing at them occasionally. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the other thing. Like I have like two thousand PDFs in my in my five E collection alone, right? Yeah. Like I buy everything, and it's nothing because like I, you know I I my all my shelves are filled with D and D books, of course. But like this is like five percent of all the products I own because hard drives are cheap. <laughs> right. right and like yeah so i think that that's that those are things that didn't really exist when that ogl glut was there is now there's True. no so there's no bottom there's it's a bottomless cabin yeah. right we can yeah. we could fill it forever well and i think a, we've also had a lot of innovation since then too it, the um the distance between pr uh creating and production have gotten smaller you don't need the distributors like the way that you had to before in order to reach an audience i think that's a really big deal i had dennis detwiller on he had a great great commentary about you know you know if you're not creating something right now then that's on you right and yeah and, right. If, no, and if your stuff's not selling your yeah yeah if you're not selling then that's on you too um he makes an argument he makes an argument that 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 quality is found um you know, and that it, that it, that it's out there and that it's not just a single piece of pie and everybody's slicing it up and there's a right. limited thing. Yes, he's, no. he's a firm believer. The pie gets bigger and bigger. Yeah. Um, and I don't disagree with that at all. He tends to say, say it in a much more caustic way than I do because yeah. he's Dennis, but, um, <laughs> it, uh, I don't think he's wrong. I don't think he's wrong. No, on that. And, and, I, and yeah. And talking to my publisher, I have some, I've like some publisher friends of mine that we get together and kind of talk shop and make fun of people. And, um, you, you know, yeah, like, all of again, like going back to the seven figure Kickstarters is like, there's no lack of money in this industry, right? Like, you know, it could be, you know, and I, the only thing I would change on like the, if you, you know, yeah, if you, if you want to create something, nothing is in your way to create it. Uh, you know, if you want to make money, everything is in your way. Oh, to make that's money. two separate things though, right? <laughs> right. And I would say like the world doesn't owe you their attention, right? No one, no one, you, you know, you don't deserve to have everyone's attention. You have to fight for it and you got to be really lucky. You know, yeah. I think like and effort and luck together are the things that, that, that it, luck is a big part of it. And, and just embracing that no and doesn't help. Right. No, just accept it. Right. Just right. accept it. And it's not just, you know, putting out 5e D&D. &D. The reason I'm in the job I'm in. 50% yeah. luck. <laughs> yeah. Let's be right. honest. Everything, you know? everything yeah. around me. I mean, my existence yeah. in the universe. Exactly. <laughs> well, it's complete right. luck. So like, 
yeah, and like that, the, that, you know, those odds are really terrible. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, it's so, it's so true. And, and and I get in this argument time with at times with people like that doesn't say I, I don't work hard. Sure, right. right. You you, say, you saying that you were lucky yeah. to be able to find the audience with Lazy Dungeon Master yeah. in no way takes away right. the amount of effort and talent and sure. work that went yeah. into making it. Yeah. But just saying, look, I got I got kind of lucky. Yeah, yeah, it takes <laughs> and right. that's okay. It, you can, just like you think about it with die rolls, right? It's like, well, it's a plus is a plus three sword better than a plus one sword yeah it, is it but it's only swinging you 10 percent on that die roll right? right it's not the end it's not it's not going from a hit to a miss every time it's exactly. just steering the odds so can you help steer the odds yes yeah you know there are things we i mean i'm work yeah i work all the time right and right. it's like i'm just all i'm doing is steering the odds right yep. all yeah, the that's time. a great way and, to put it that's yeah. a great way to put it um is there anything um from an industry standpoint um that makes you really happy right now or makes you excited about tomorrow Oh man. I mean, this whole industry makes me happy, you know, and I, I, I guess the constant continuing growth makes me happy. Yeah. Uh, the, the expansion of voices makes me really happy. Oh, it's so great. Right. And, and seeing the demographic change and seeing, you know, yeah, seeing, seeing that this, that the hobby is embracing diversity and, yeah. you know, rejecting, you know, ignorance. Right. Yep. And and I think that that's important. I, um, I agree. I agree. And yeah, so I'm, I'm very happy about that. Uh, I, I just, you know, I'm, I guess, is there something more specific? I don't know. It's hard to say. I'm just, you well, know, I, I really, I really just try to, to see the future with, with open eyes, you know, to try to, to you know, I don't know what's going to be good. I don't know what's going to be bad. Sure. Yeah. I'm not and, asking and for I'm, predictions. And I'm excited. No, 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 yeah. yeah. And I'm just excited to, to, to see new things come out. You know, I, yeah, I, and, I, really and I don't like think pe- there's, I think to a certain degree, people can, um, not fully understand what your first point was and how big that is, that, 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 that the circle's getting bigger. Yeah people that that were didn't we didn't hear before we're hearing now and they're and they're participating now and they're being part of that it's a really big deal and i'm also uh very much into miniature gaming yep. and war games and stuff like that rpgs are so ahead of the curve on this it's not even <laughs> funny it's not even funny to the point where when i go back to my miniature gaming world and look i'm like what the fuck guys like get your shit together you <laughs> yeah. know yeah. And, and i'm not saying that rpgs have figured it out Right. I'm just saying that they're ahead, right? Yeah. And, and, and they're headed not, in the yeah. right direction. There's still, there are bumps in that road. Yeah. The, the other yeah. thing that I think is really interesting about it, and there's something I've always loved about this hobby, because I always, you know, I always worry for the, the the shoe to drop. Like I was talking to another, somebody who's been in this industry for 30 years and I'm, I'm, I'm they're kind of a mentor of mine. And I'm like, well, I don't know what, what's this thing that's happening? Helping you like, this is why that's happening. Oh, okay. Right. And, uh, and I asked him, like, you know, should I quit my job? And he's like, nope. <laughs> and yep. he's like, I've been through two of these bubbles before. And you don't know, maybe it's different. Maybe it's not, right? But yep. I can tell you it's happened before. And it's been up yep. and then it's down. And then it's up and then it's down. So, you know, so be, be prepared, right? Prepare yourself for ups, ups and downs. And the thing I love about it is, like, if I have the three core books, I can play D&D for the rest of my life. And nothing in the world... You know, I was like, D&D is the only hobby I've had, maybe fountain pens, that can survive a nuclear war. <laughs> nice. Right? We're like, we could lose all electronics in the world and be sitting around campfires still playing D&D, you know, and all we need are the books and and, and no one can take them away from us. Yep. And even if like I picked up um, the the old school essentials book, right? Like good, this good one book. book that sort of captures all of the original zero E D and D style. Yep. And I looked at it and I was like, isn't it amazing that this one book that cost me like 30 bucks has this game that I could just sit and play with my friends forever for the I'm rest dead. of your life, yep. for the rest of my life. And, and that's like, that's, and, and, and no, nobody could take it from me. It's not going to degrade. If I put it on a shelf and take care of it, it will be the same as it was when I bought it. No other piece of electronics, no other video game, you know, will be like that, you know, but, 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 you know, I mean, there have been polyhedral dice since Rome, right. you know, and, and so I, I love that aspect of it. I yep. love, I love the, 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 the longevity and the resilience that this game can have, regardless of like what happens. Like there's always this worry of like, well, what if Watsy fucks things up, right? Like what if they go down this route and they're like Hasbro, 
move the vice president of Watsi up to or move the you know Watsi president up to a vice yeah. president role. All this like politics, and now they're going to like make bubblegum, you know, new new sugar drinks based on characters from D and D, and then like they just dick with the whole game. And it's like that's okay. I've got five E, and I love it. Right. So I'm good. And even if I didn't, I still have every other one of these games, and they're good too. And people are going to keep making new ones, and those are going to be good. So like it's it's just. It's so different. Like, you know, when I was big into EverQuest that like I had to work with the develop. Like I, I was as kind of into EverQuest as I am in D&D. And like I knew the developers of the game. And I remember there was like this, this meta game where if you could convince the developers to beef up your weapon, it was as good as getting a new weapon in game. Right. And so you work both angles. Sure. And, sure. But the key was like they could dick up the game and you'd never play it again. Yeah, because they own every aspect of the game. Right. D- no one like, you know, so so Xanathar's Guide came out for fifth edition and it's really great. Tasha's came out and I'm not as crazy about it. Right. Like some stuff in there is amazing and really, really good. And then there's some stuff in there that's like weird and complicated and doesn't work as well as I'd hope. And, and I'm like, oh, they broke D&D. No, like I just say, hey, we're not going to use those builds, guys. Exactly. Right? And me and the, me and my five friends at my table i'll make an agreement that we don't want to use a thing and then it's, it's we're fine right and then the game is solid so that's that's you know one thing i love about it is knowing that this game will be around basically for as long as humanity is around yeah I, and i'll tell you the other thing that i find very interesting um and it's a surprise for me is um the economics of of the industry because one of the big big problems with the industry is you buy one book and you entertain dozens of people and they yeah. don't buy another book, right? right. And, the, and yep. the, you know, you don't have to. But with things like Patreon, with the, the success of Kickstarter and stuff like that, we've now see the money. We see people have been wanting to spend the money and we see that money flooding in and that's a good thing, not a bad thing. Yeah, yeah. You know, there is sort of like the shoe drop problem right which I'm, i i think about it from my own you know because now I'm, i've gone from hobbyist to kind of a business right sure and um luckily for me i have other sources of income so i'm like you know i'll be fine i, I followed my advice from the, my mentor and said no i won't quit my job <laughs> i'll lower the hours yeah. but i can always bring those hours back up if things exactly. go back exactly and um but i look at the numbers and one thing i worry about is like someday everybody who wants return to the lazy dungeon master is going to have it and then like my sales, which have been going fine, are going to go poop and they're going to fall right off a cliff and no yep. one will buy it again. And, you know, so I, I do think that like unlike a subscription sort of service, you bring a Patreon, right. right? And unlike a subscription sort of service where you sort of always have to keep paying me in order to get your thing. I, I, a, I don't want to do that. I want people to buy a book and own it. Right. Right. Just because I, I, I the same resilience we were talking about. But I do worry that like, you know, will there be a point where it just kind of falls off this cliff? And hopefully I have another big book that does well. But I haven't since then. <laughs> like I've written a lot of books since then, and they're great and they're doing fine, but they're not like that. <laughs> sure. And um, you know, so and that was what happened with Wizards of the Coast, right? That like when they did these books, they 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 saw that there was this big steep drop off in people who bought the core books. And luckily for Fifth, that hasn't happened. The core books have been continuing to sell year after year. They said that thirty percent growth in twenty twenty, right? <laughs> so which is nuts because they've been doubling every eighteen months in like the previous five years. Yeah. So. But but eventually everybody will. And then you think like, oh, it's going and it's not going to trail off. It's going to fall off a cliff because everybody will have. I have no idea if that's true. I'm not an economist and I haven't studied it in the past. Well, but I, I mean, it, but it that, is. that seems now, like it could a, be a, a, a problem. It's not an if it's a when. Right. Yeah. And and there's that's also watch. He's not going to sit there and watch it happen either. Right. So right. we can't make the assumption. Yeah. Like with the, there's people they've much got, smarter than you and I vault. Right. They got a 60 exactly. vault ready to pull back. Here you go. Exactly. Brand new exactly. One. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's people a lot smarter than you and I running that company right now. And they're, 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 they're going to see that coming around. <laughs> I'm not so they sure are. I'd say that. Go that far. When, when, <laughs> when, 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 it, when it comes to this type of stuff, I mean, yeah. here's the way to think about it. Who's got the most skin in the game? Right. Sure. But human beings matters. are irrational creatures, no matter where they are. <laughs> right. But we don't have one human making those decisions. Yeah, I guess that's what I'm thinking. Is. All right. Lorraine <laughs> Williams thought it was a really good idea to make a six edition D&D. Well, I'm, so, not, I'm not, not, saying that, not saying that. Yeah. Well, so, I, I, we, we, we don't disagree as much as we think we do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, to me, one of the things that I think about, like, so a lot of times I read like Reddit or my Discord server and stuff and people bring up 6E and like, when's that coming out? Um, and there actually is an interesting 
bit of evidence that they're not going to come out with 6e uh, in the immediate future based on investments that they've made but um but for before those there was like when is it coming out is it going to come out soon and everybody like had like mathematical models that they built of like oh it's going to come out at this time and i was like look at every instance of the previous editions and the, almost every one was basically one person making a choice you know yep. a senior executive or a new president or whatever and yeah Lorraine williams made second edition and then wizards of the coast bought tsr and they made a third edition i don't know and 3.5 i don't know what happened but then 4e was like hey we want to do video games you know we want you know we want to change the brand for that and then fifth edition and i i loved it and i uh, lee i think it was leeds was the guy's name uh and i actually got to stand there and hear him say it to an interview doing he was doing a podcast with a friend of mine and i heard him say it and they said like you just let an entire branch of of your development team spend two years not making a product to play test fifth, you know, to play test a new edition of D anD. d How are you paying for that? And he's like Magic, you know, Magic the Gathering is yeah. paying for it, and we're fine with that. And I was like, he made that choice. He could have easily said, never mind, we're going to turn it into branding and we're going to give it to movies and TV shows, and we're not sure. doing another edition and fire all those people. He could have done that. Instead, he's like, now let's see how it goes. So you know, maybe he had a he didn't have a bad sandwich that day, <laughs> and, you know, and instead he could have just as likely gone one direction or the other. So I I, I think that that makes new additions a relatively unpredictable. Uh, variable, I agree. right? But the interesting variable that has changed things is, um, and and many of my publisher friends who who did think a six E was inevitable, changed their minds, and it was Watsi Watsi bringing in house a major translation team to make foreign language or non non English language versions of five E, and they said like you don't spend that kind of money yeah. to translate books into four languages if you're going to make a new version in like a year or two. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. So I said, OK, that they, I, I, I didn't even make that assessment, but like enough of my friends did. Yeah. Um, but no, that's it's always a good dangerous point. too, because they're all experts. And as we know, experts are terrible at prediction. So <laughs> I, I, we need a thousand people to tell to us. <laughs> yeah, I should probably go back and like do a couple of tweet polls. Right. Yeah. And see what Twitter has to say, because they're probably more accurate. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, Mike, I really appreciate you making the time, man. Yeah, this is great. Outstanding. I, I, I always I always love talking about this stuff. Um, so obviously we're going to have links in the show notes. Uh, so everybody's listening. You can scroll down right now and you can see links to uh, all the books that we've talked about, um, including his Amazon store, um, where you can check out the other books that people need to be buying more than just lazy dungeon master because <laughs> it's good. good stuff too Buy if you want it like, i'm not going to push anything it's but yeah. in general mike if someone who wants more mike outside of you know yeah. outside of the books where should they go sly flourish so go okay. to slyflourish.com my website uh the front page I, I i regularly so the the front page is hand edited uh except for a little block that has like the latest articles but everything else i go there and i try to make sure that every all of the other aspects if you want me and and your life in different ways, whether it's YouTube or podcast or discord or Twitter or, you know, I don't know what I'm not on TikTok yet, but you know, Oh, newsletter, you know, my, my social network of the future, uh, an email, an email newsletter. And, <laughs> You're so uh, ahead of times. <laughs> I'll tell you, I'll give you, I'll give you a little publisher tip, uh, 20 times more effective than Twitter. That doesn't surprise me at all. <laughs> yeah. So it surprises lots of other people. So yeah, newsletter is a really effective mechanism, shockingly, given how much of a trend well, I'm going to add to that, Mike. A, yeah. a good newsletter is sure. more effective, yeah. right? Yeah. And I'm not I've, sure I'm there yet. Like I, uh, you know, it, it, I like it. I enjoy I'm, it. Um, well, I like you and I like you and uh, <laughs> you, you and Force. I think both you guys have good newsletters. Oh, um, thank you. Yeah. But there's other newsletters, and I'm like, yeah, I'm good. Thanks. Yeah. The, the, the <laughs> thing I'm trying to do is recognize that more people now get my blog articles as a newsletter than they do reading the blog. So I need to think of it as I'm writing a newsletter that's getting published on my site, not the other yeah. way around. And I'm yeah. not there yet. The main thing I'm trying to do is just keep them shorter. You yeah. know, get it, get it down. And that's also what I did with YouTube. Is like, you know, what made that big stair step with youtube was going to three to five minute videos yep. rather than an hour of me talking about nonsense so um yeah so so yeah it, it, subscribing to my newsletter is great but if you want to see all the other ways there's a big block that says hey if you want more slight flourish in your life here's beautiful eight different ways and pick which ones you want i, I won't be insulted you know, <laughs> okay you, great i won't so be like insulted I said- if you only pick one <laughs> like I said, guys, you can scroll down right now. We've got links to all of that. Um, all right, Mike, uh, we're going to have to figure out a reason and an excuse to have you come back on. Sure. All oh, right. And for, do I need to give you ahead. one? <laughs> <laughs> no, we'll, we'll do that you off the All right, great. <laughs> and for those of you that stuck around all the way to the end, I appreciate you too. Thanks for listening. Take care. We hope you enjoyed 
enjoyed this episode, subscribe to Tabletop Talk and share it with your friends. Check out our content on YouTube and Twitch. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook and stay updated on everything coming from Third Floor. All the links are in the show notes. Take care, floor heads. You still here? Wow. Um, well, the episode is over, but if you're bored, why not go to patreon.com and support the show for as little as a dollar a month? Yeah, you can just scroll down. Scroll down and, yeah, get the link. It's Patreon that makes this and all of our other content possible. Don't you want to join the other floor heads on the Patreon Discord? Anyway. Thanks for sticking around. Take care.